everybody. Come on, let's do that again. Kim, everybody. Yes. Yes. Thank you, guys. This is rad. Look at how many humans there are in this room right now. This is going to last like 30 minutes, so if you guys are into standing up for the whole time, you can do that. If not, feel free to sit on the ground. This ground looks pretty clean to me. You can pretend like we're in a living room watching a band from the 90s. It'll be awesome. Um, God, do I want to be tethered to this thing? Let me see. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll do it for a little bit, and then I might put it down. Uh, my name is Dallas Clayton. I write kids' books. And I travel around and I read books to kids. The types of books that I write uh, address big themes and big ideas, broad concepts like love and hope and gratefulness and dreams. And because these concepts are so big and so broad and so bold, I am afforded the luxury not only of traveling around and reading to small children, but also middle school, high school, college, extra large children such as yourselves, <laughs> sometimes known as adults. Uh, and in doing this, I've learned a couple lessons about myself, about the world, about how children interact and how we interact with them. And I thought I'd come and share some of those lessons with you guys today. Perhaps these lessons are big enough that you can pull them down and form smaller bite-sized lessons and put them in your pocket, carry them around with you, maybe use them today, tomorrow, 15 years from now, to make your life better, to make the lives better of the people around you. I call them kid lessons. Kid lessons. So when I go and I read to a class, I like to ask them questions. And one of my favorite questions to ask is what do you dream of? If you could do anything, if you could be anything, if you could say anything, what would your dream be? And this answer changes, changes most specifically based on the age of the group. If you talk to kids that are five and under, you say what do you dream of? You could have anything in the world. The most common answer you're going to hear multiple desserts. <laughs> Most kids under the age of five are just trying to figure out a way to put cookies and cake into the same meal, which is awesome because this is such an attainable goal. <laughs> I imagine everyone in this room could figure out a way to obtain multiple desserts, and yet I don't know how many of you woke up this morning and had cookies and cake for breakfast, which leads me to believe Perhaps some of you have given up on your five-year-old dreams. <laughs> when you talk to kids that are a little bit older, six, seven, eight years old, say, what do you guys dream of? Another answer comes up, a really common answer. They say, I want to be a famous basketball player. I want to be a famous rock star. I want to be a famous actor. And everywhere I would go, I would hear it over and over again. Fame, 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 fame. And after a while, I started saying, hey, what if you don't get to be a famous basketball player, but you get to play basketball every day for the rest of your life, and you get to love it and enjoy it, and it's super fun, but you don't get to be famous. Is that still okay? And the kid would look at me and he'd say, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what fame is because I'm six. <laughs> My dad's famous to me because I'm six. The guy that works the donut shop is like the most famous donut shop guy I could ever imagine. And he seems happy because he gets to get up every day and make donuts, which is like multiple desserts. So <laughs> it's really living. When you talk to kids that are a little bit older, start going into middle school, dreams change again. Start saying things like, what do you guys dream of? They say, I want to be a dentist. I want to be a lawyer. I want to work at GameStop. <laughs> Talk to a fifth grade class. I think it means they want to live in a video game, but the closest they can come is working at GameStop. Which again, 
totally attainable goal. <laughs> But after they go through their careers, and I say, what do you dream of? And they say, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a dentist, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a marine biologist, I want to work at GameStop. There's always one kid in the back of the class. Perhaps you were this kid. Raises his hand, raises her hand. Says, yeah, I have a dream. I was thinking that I could go into the jungle and get a bunch of monkeys together and, and maybe I could learn to communicate telepathically with them and then we could build a time machine. We could take the time machine back in time and like change the way things were and then like, I don't know, go on adventures and stuff. It'd be really cool. <laughs> and then they look at me and I look at them and I say, cool. And then everyone else in the class looks at me and looks at them and they say, I... Uh, I didn't, I know when you said we could dream of anything, I know you meant anything, anything, because I know I said the GameStop thing, but I want, can I change my answer? Because the, the time traveling monkey thing sounds really cool. When you go a little bit older, it changes again. Um, I live in Los Angeles, but I'm from North Carolina originally, and I got flown back to North Carolina by my publisher to do a, a book festival. And they set up some school readings in the morning. One of the school readings was at a Head Start program, really little kids, pre preschool kids. And the second one was at a high school. So I went to the Head Start program and I talked to these kids and I said, what do you guys dream of? And these kids, full of so much energy, so much love for life, answering questions I hadn't even asked yet, right? What do you guys do? Oh, they go, well, we're a wizard dog, right? <laughs> I, well, I don't, uh, what's a wizard? It's a dog and a wizard combined into an animal wizard. Oh, it was in the name. Okay. <laughs> but these kids were so full of love and hope and joy and it filled me with passion. I thought to myself, we're going to be okay. These kids have it under control. Eventually, I'm going to get to see what a wizard dog is. <laughs> and then I drove across town to the high school reading. I should mention that my publisher not only thought it would be a good idea for me to do a high school reading, but for me to do a reading at the high school that I graduated from many years earlier. I don't know if anyone in this room has ever had the opportunity to read a children's picture book at the high school that you graduated from. <laughs> but I highly recommend this experience. <laughs> now when I was in high school, I specifically remember there being a battle fought daily between me and a hierarchy of principals and teachers and we were going at it and things were happening and it was real important. And then I got back to my high school and I was pretty sure I could touch all of the walls with my hands stretched out. And I was pretty sure that that football field was not regulation size. And I think that the teacher that I thought was 56 years old was actually 22 at the time. <laughs> so I go in in this small place and I do a reading and I talk to the kids and at the end, I, high school seniors by the way, I say, uh, is there anything you guys dream of doing? If you guys could do anything, if you could be anything, what would it be? And uh, total silence, tumbleweeds are tumbling through. So, okay, I get it. The old narc has come to school to try to get you guys to cop to having dreams. I understand. So I find a kid in the front row. Looks like a cool kid, I can tell, because he's sitting in a way that lets me know that he does not care about his posture at all. <laughs> and I say, hey man, what do you dream of doing? He slumps further down into his chair and he says uh -huh. a noise that lets me know that he's so disinterested with what I've just said that he can't even bother forming a word to tell me. So, Alright, cool. Going about this all wrong. Maybe that's too big of a question. Let's reverse engineer this. Is there anything you don't want to do? Uh -huh. Completely indifferent to either doing or not doing anything. And I'm looking at this kid's face and I'm looking at the faces of the kids around him and I'm thinking to myself, man, 10 years ago, a mile away from this location, these seniors were these kids in this Head Start program. These kids with so many dreams and so many ideas that they were climbing over themselves to give these answers. They had 10 years to develop these ideas. They should have blueprints and schematics as to how the wizard dog is going to work and how they're going to execute it and it's going to be an app and how we're going to get it delivered to ourselves. But they don't. They have the opposite of that. Why? Did, it, did they disappear? Did the dreams vanish? And I'm looking at this kid's face and he's looking around at his friends 
and his friends all have a similar energy and he's looking at them and he's looking at me and I can see a look in his face a very familiar look maybe you've seen it on the friends of yours faces I've seen it on my friends faces from time to time see it in the mirror it's a look of fear specific fear the fear that if he admits that he has a dream in front of his class inside his school where the walls are so small and they don't have a regulation sized football field and everything in that world is right here if he admits that he wants to be a famous basketball player and he doesn't become a famous basketball player then he's a failure that's how he feels and I've been outside of this school and I've gone through the world and I've ridden on an airplane and seen an elephant and had all sorts of mistakes happen to me and I know that those thoughts aren't true and I want to just touch him on the face and say man let's get out of here but I can't so instead I say hey does anybody in here know how to ride a bike and they all reluctantly raise their hands and I say does anybody in here want to be a professional cyclist and they say no I say exactly when you see someone riding a bike down the street, you don't look out the window and say, there goes a failed professional cyclist. <laughs> oh, I could have been Lance Armstrong if I just would have tried harder. No. You say, there goes someone riding a bike. That looks fun. Riding a bike is fun. Like learning to play an instrument is fun. Like learning to take pictures is fun. Like learning a new language is fun. These are things that you can do that make you a part of a community that make you a part of the world that allow you to participate and you don't do them because you want to be the most famous cyclist you don't do them because you want to beat everyone else you do them because they're important but the first step to doing any of those things is being able to admit that you have a dream and whether you admit it to yourself in front of a mirror in your bathroom with a hairbrush singing like a microphone or in front of your class, or to your parents, or on stage in front of a bunch of strangers. The first step is being able to admit that you have a dream. Kid lessons. So this girl wrote me an email. She went to the Savannah College of Art and Design. And the email said, How do you maintain a childlike sense of wonder? Right? That's where we're living right now. You can just send an email to someone you don't know that has like a really gigantic question. <laughs> and whether or not they want to answer it, they have to spend the rest of the week thinking about it, right? <laughs> Dear Tom Hanks, why do we exist? I don't know. <laughs> so, so I think about it all week. What childlike sense of wonder. Why, why are children wonderful? Am I, am, I, am I full of wonder when I see a child? What is he wondering about? What do these things mean? right? I don't know. And I'm looking at my son. I'm looking at uh, the kids that I read books to. I'm looking at the work that I do and I'm thinking about it the whole time and I start to realize something. I start to realize that when you're a kid, especially a young kid, you go out every day. You leave your house every day and you have new experiences, right? You touch things that you haven't touched before. What does that feel like? What happens if I do this? Okay, that's cool. This one's this one's soft. I oh, know. See. Okay. Cool. And you learn things. And this one's bright. That's what that one does. <laughs> this one. Uh, I don't know if I should drink that one. And you start learning these things about yourself, right? You start realizing the difference between hot and cold. You start realizing the difference between up and down. You start realizing who you are. Building up the things that you like and dislike. And then eventually you get to a place where you pass that. You stop knowing who you are and you start knowing who you think you are. Right? You start saying things like, Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to like that one. I don't, I, I don't really go to that side of town. I haven't been there, but I don't think I want to go there. I don't, I don't really like those kind of people. I, I don't really vote that way. And every time you do that, you put up a wall. Right? And every single one of those walls gets you further and further away from ever having these childlike experiences from ever putting yourself in a place where you can be filled with that wonder of what's going to happen if I do this. But, what if you left your work like you do every day, 
taking the same route that's the fastest route to get you home because there's an app that tells you what's the fastest way to get home because you want to get home and do the thing that's really important to you. What if you left the house, you left your job, and instead of going left, instead of going right, you went straight. Instead of going right, you went left. Instead of going left, you went right. And you went up a hill five minutes away, five minutes out of the way, and you went to the top of that hill, and you felt like, I've been to this hill before. And you decided, hey, I'm going to watch the sunset. And you think to yourself, I watched the sunset a million times. But maybe I haven't watched the sunset from the top of this hill on this day, feeling these feelings right now that I'm feeling. And because you do that, you have a thought or an experience or you fall down and you pick yourself back up or you meet someone new and the thing that you do changes your entire life forever. And that happens every day. That happens every day with kids. Every day they're going out and having these experiences that are changing their life forever. And that could be happening every day with you guys. But you have to put yourself out there. You have to put yourself into those situations because you're not a kid anymore. You know that this is a chair. You know that this is a beer. You know that this is a thing that projects light, right? You can't convince yourself that you don't know those things, but you can go out and try to find those experiences. And that is how you maintain a childlike sense of wonder. And I don't mean that you should go out and jump off the roof of your house because you've never done it before. <laughs> Though that might be cool. <laughs> but that's not what we ask kids to do either, right? Hopefully, the kids that are, that are being raised are surrounded in some capacity by people that love them and support them. Maybe a mom, a dad, a coach, a teacher, a friend, right? And that coach, that teacher, that friend, that mom, that dad is going to allow them to fall down and then help them back up. And eventually, they become that for themselves. So that when you go out and get lost at the top of that hill, you still know, I could probably find my way back. But that's what it takes to have those wonderful moments. Kid lessons. So I went to pick my son up from school. Uh, in this story, he was seven years old. And I got to school, and the teacher came up to me, and she said, your son's in timeout. He was in a fight. Your son was in a fight. I know you may be looking at me and thinking, that guy probably gets in a lot of fights. It's not the case. <laughs> I write children's books. <laughs> try to uh, teach my son not to get into a lot of fights. Try to keep my son, uh, uh, teach him how to talk his way out of things, right? Actually, one of my favorite stories about my son is when he was really, really young, I was at a playground and uh, I saw these two kids fighting over this dump truck, right? My son was with them. And I looked down, I looked back up, and the kids were hitting each other. And my son was nowhere to be found. I started looking around, a little bit of panic, and I see him. And he's 50 yards away, playing frisbee with a girl. And I thought to myself, right on. <laughs> <laughs> if ever two knuckleheads are fighting about something that is totally inconsequential, the best place you can be is 50 yards away, playing frisbee with a girl. <laughs> Think about that the next time someone steps on your shoes at the bar. Perhaps keep a frisbee in your trunk. <laughs> But at this moment, seven years old, he is not 50 yards away playing frisbee. He has been in a fight at school and he is in timeout. So I come up to him and I say, what happened? And he's blanketed with fear. And he tells me the story. He says, I was on the bleachers. I was reading my robot magazine. <coughs> Full disclosure, he was not reading a robot magazine. He was reading a copy of Sky Mall <laughs> that he thought was a robot magazine. <laughs> This sky mall is full of absurd inventions. <laughs> my son doesn't know that. So, so I was reading my robot magazine and Joey came up to me and Joey said, hey, why are you reading that nerd magazine? And my son said, leave me alone. And Joey left and Joey came back a little while later and said, hey man, why are you still reading that nerd magazine? My son said, hey, leave me alone. Joey left. Joey came back a third time said, hey, Quit reading that nerd magazine. Slapped the magazine out of my son's hand. My son punched Joey in the stomach. Joey started to cry. End of story. <laughs> now, as a parent, there's a huge part of me that hears this story and says, that's not how we act. We solve our problems with words. You don't need to resort to violence. Solve a conflict like this. As a human being, 
There's another part of me that thinks, perhaps Joey had three chances <laughs> to avoid this conflict, and maybe the lesson that Joey just learned is how to read the signs a little bit better. <laughs> but you can't say that. You certainly can't say that in front of the teachers and the principal. So I said, we'll talk about this in the car. We get in the car, and we're driving home. And I'm thinking about it in my head. I don't know how many of you are parents, but a lot of these situations come and you kind of just got to go with it. You don't know what happened. What do you say? What do you do? And you start thinking about it for yourself. Hopefully, you put yourself in that situation. You think, why don't we punch random strangers? I don't know, right? What, I, what is the answer? Is it philosophical? Is it emotional? Is it our nature? Is that who we are as humans? And I'm thinking about these things and I realize I don't know anything about Joey. Right? My son's been going to school with this kid for five years. I don't, I don't really know anything about him other than his name. So I say to my son, hey, tell me something about Joey. What do you mean? So you've been going to school with him for five years? Describe him to me. He says, uh, well, he's fast. Right? If you ever want to feel good about yourself, you should have the seven-year-old describe you because guarantee they're going to say some things that you had not considered as part of your skill set. <laughs> It says here, Mr. Clayton, that you're incredibly fast. Oh, I am super fast. You got the job! <laughs> so my son says he's fast. Okay. What else? He's got a red shirt. <laughs> he's fast, he's got a red shirt. You've known this kid for five years. You got anything else for me? Nah, that's all I got. And as we're having this conversation, a guy walks in front of the car and he's on crutches. And I say to my son, hey, do you know that guy? And he says, no. So if that guy was your brother, do you think you would be more likely or less likely to help him across the street? And he said, more likely. I said, why? Because well, I know him and I, you know, I care about him. I said, exactly. I want you to go to school tomorrow. I want you to learn something about Joey. I want you to get to know Joey. My son said, this sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> I just punched this dude in the stomach. You want me to go talk to him? I said, trust me. Trust me. Okay. So he goes to school, the next day I go to pick him up, my son comes out and he is beaming. He says, you'll never guess what happened. I talked to Joey, turns out he likes Pokemon, I like Pokemon, what are the odds? <laughs> the odds are pretty good. <laughs> but my son doesn't know that, so I just say, that's amazing! He says, yeah, we're going to get together, we're going to trade Pokemon cards, we're going to start a Pokemon club together, it's going to be awesome. And that was two years ago. My son and Joey are best friends. Right? And we live in this world where we're constantly connected, right? We're all walking around with a computer in our pocket with pictures of people in it. Some of those faces we know, some of those faces we don't know. And maybe we pick out that phone every once in a while when we're feeling insecure and we're waiting in line somewhere. And we're looking at these pictures thinking, what is this hat that he is wearing? Who? Why so many pictures of his baby? Who, why am I even following this guy? <laughs> right? But maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe this is an opportunity to say, Hey, who is this person? How could I get to know this person? How could I see this person a little bit deeper? How could I make a connection with this person so that they're not just another face? So that they become closer to being my brother than being some stranger on the street. So that they stop being a face 3,000 miles away that I could say anything I want about on the internet because they're not real to me and they start becoming a human. And we're surrounded by these opportunities every day, right? You're sitting in a room right now. People next to you, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Maybe this is an opportunity. Take a minute. Maybe you know the person next to you, maybe you don't. Say hello. I'll wait. <laughs> This is how easy it is, right? This could be happening every day. This could be happening every day when you walk by someone on the street and you think you saw them a couple times maybe, but you don't know their name. You can just go up and say, hey, my name's Dallas. What's your name? Wilfredo. Wilfredo, yeah. beautiful. Hey, do you like Pokemon? <laughs> Me neither. I don't like Pokemon either. Now we got something in common. And we're not best friends yet, but we're one step closer. 
he's not a stranger now. If I see him trying to carry something up the stairs, maybe I'm more likely to help him. Maybe he's more likely to help me. Maybe if I need a cup of sugar to bake a cake, I can go next door and talk to my neighbor now and say, hey neighbor, whose name I don't know because we don't live in a world where it's cool to know your neighbor's name. Can I borrow a cup of sugar? And that'll bring us one step closer. One step closer to being best friends. Kid lessons. So the last kid lesson um, is the most recent kid lesson. Happened a couple months ago. Uh, it was a friend of mine's 40th birthday party. The first friend I've ever had to turn 40. That's a thing that happens to you, right? <laughs> My first friend turned 40. My friend actually, his job is a professional skateboarder. His job, throw himself downstairs. My job, draw unicorns and dinosaurs. These are real occupations. Don't limit yourself. <laughs> Someone ask you what your dreams are. You can make up whatever you want. So my friend is turning 40 and the birthday party is about 30 minutes away from where I live in LA. Six o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, traffic. Put my son in the car. My son's 10 years old at this point get in the car and we start driving and as much as I want to be the guy that turns left instead of right and goes up to the top of the hill and watches the sunset from time to time you get stuck in traffic it's a reality so I'm in traffic and I'm trying not to be the one that's hunched over the wheel and cursing in my head and as I'm doing that I'm thinking about how when my son was younger we used to spend so much time together just entertaining ourselves with nothing right string in a cardboard box spend a couple hours just playing make-believe doesn't happen so much anymore and I was thinking about it and I was like oh when he was younger I used to make my hand into this rabbit and the rabbit would talk in kind of a uh, Armenian meets French meets I can't do an accent sort of accent right like how are you doing what's going on right <laughs> but I hadn't done it in so long I totally forgot this guy's name right so I'm sitting there, my son's beside me, and we're stuck in traffic, and I say, hey, do you remember this guy? What's going on? And my son says, Raul! Where have you been? And immediately I vanish, and my son's 10-year-old self vanishes, and he's, he's, he's a toddler, he's in a land of make-believe. And Raul starts regaling him with stories about all the adventures he's been on and my son is catching up with him. And I'm invisible. I'm a spectator. I just get to watch this whole thing. Back and forth they go for 20 minutes talking about all kinds of made-up stuff. It's great. After a while, my hand starts to cramp up a bit. <laughs> I say, all right, I love you. I gotta go. I love you too, Raul. And Raul disappears into the steering wheel. I say, that was cool. Raul stopped by. My son says, yeah. And there's kind of a moment. The sun's starting to set a little bit. It's getting dark. So air gets a little thicker in the car. I can kind of feel it. And my son says, Dad, is Raul going to die? And I say, well, no, what are you talking about, man? Raul's like a part of us. And he's going to be here with us forever. It's going to be awesome. Okay. And then a minute passes, and now the air is just, it's like it's not in the car anymore. It's gone heavy it's dark and I look over and through the darkness I can see that my son is starting to cry and I say well what's wrong and he says well I just realized that Raul's gonna die and that means you're gonna die and that means mom's gonna die I don't know if you've ever made a human being before and then had that human being contemplate their own mortality but there's not a rule book for this there's not a playbook there's not cliff notes you kind of just gotta go with what you have in your pocket at the time. So my first play is, uh, oh no, look how young I am. I got friends that are skateboarders. This is gonna be all, no, don't worry about it, man. I'm gonna live a long time. My son says, you're just saying that. I say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just try number two here. My son really likes music, likes to play music, likes to listen to music like a lot of kids do. I say, well, you know when you hear a song a song that you really love, chances are that band might not even be a band anymore, right? That band might have broken up years ago and the members of that band might have disappeared into the universe somewhere, right? But you still hear that song and it still makes you feel good. You could be walking through 
walking through the city, you could be pumping your gas, you could be in the grocery store having the worst day ever. Taxes are due and your rent's overdue and you don't know what's going on. You hear that song, some random song, and it hits you right there and fills you with a joy. Makes you want to laugh or smile or dance. Or brings you back to a place that you remember that was real special at the time, right? So I say to my son, like, maybe that's what it is, right? We're all walking around worrying about our bands, right? Worrying about who's going to play bass, who's going to put the album out, who's going to distribute it, whether or not we're going to get a gold record, where we're going to play. But really it's about the songs, right? It's about the songs that we're making. And those songs go on way beyond us, right? They go get to live in a world that you don't ever get to see, right? They get to affect people in ways you don't even know, in their houses, in their cars, while they're jogging around the lake, right? They get to have these moments that don't have anything to do with you, but they do, right? Because you were there, you helped create those moments. Maybe that's what it is. These songs. And you can tell that my son is starting to warm to this idea, but he's still a little broken up about it, right? He's still got a little bit of a tear in his eye. And I realize, I say, hey, you know what? There are going to be a lot of times in your life, especially if you're a boy growing up in America, where people are going to tell you not to cry, right? They're going to say, suck it up, man up. You see people, when they're on TV, when they're accepting an award, when they're doing an interview, they start to cry. The first thing they do is apologize. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to do this. I didn't know this was going to happen. No, that's the song, right? That's what it is. You're being driven to emote by a human experience, right? You're being pushed to a place where you can't even control yourself. Enjoy that. Don't apologize for that. That's rare. That's magic. And I say to my son, look, imagine you were laughing so hard at some joke that you couldn't even control yourself and someone came up to you and told you to stop laughing. You would just laugh more. <laughs> right? And my son starts to laugh and he says, now I'm crying because I'm laughing. At that point, I just lose it. And he says, you're crying. And I say, yeah. And he says, why? I say, because I'm proud of you. And by that point, we had missed our exit like three or four times. <laughs> Driving around in circles. I pull up to a stoplight and I'm trying to figure out where we are. And I look over to the right and I say, I know what that is. Turn off real quick. That's wet cement. Get out of the car. Write my name in the wet cement. I say to my son, go ahead. He says, is this legal? <laughs> I say, trust me. He writes his name. Raul shows up. Raul writes his name in the cement. <laughs> And we go to my friend's 40th birthday party. And normally I would have walked into this party maybe the same way some of you guys would have walked into the party talking about I was stuck on the 405, I had to go to the 110, there was traffic and it was, oh, it was, oh, it was such a bummer and now I'm here and now let's just eat some pizza. But instead I walked in and I was like, oh my God, you guys, I just had one of the best experiences of my entire life and I was stuck in traffic. And I'm so glad to be here with you, my friend that's turning 40. I love you and I'm so glad to be here for this experience. And if there's a common thread in any of these lessons, these kid lessons, right? Whether it's figuring out what you dream about or trying to pull yourself together with a community, putting yourself in situations where you have new experiences or taking common experiences and making them a little bit more extraordinary, is that you have to try. You have to push yourself to do these things. One of my favorite answers when I ask the group of kids, what do you dream about? Perhaps my favorite answer is I don't know. Right? I look at the group of kids and I don't mean I don't know like you slumped over in your chair and you kind of half-heartedly tell me the answer. I mean someone comes to you, they say, what do you want to do? You raise your hand, you stand up and say, I don't know. There was a period where I thought I wanted multiple desserts. <laughs> then. I knew I wanted to be a professional basketball player. Then there was a point where I had this monkey plan. I don't really know what happened to that. And now I don't have any idea, man. Maybe tomorrow I want to play guitar. Maybe the day after that, I want to start a company. Maybe I want to be a doctor. I don't really have any idea. Maybe the thing that I want to do, maybe the thing that I dream about hasn't even been invented yet. The other day my son got a, like a little rash on his leg, right? It happens. When you have a kid, I was getting into trouble. 
And I looked at the rash and I realized, oh, we have to go to the doctor. You go to the doctor, you get the ointment, you get the prescription, do the thing. And I looked at it and I was like, I bet there's an app for this. And I looked at my phone and there was. <laughs> I picked up my phone. On the other end of the phone, there's a doctor somewhere in a video conference, looks at the rash, tells me what it is, gets me an ointment, prescribes it, I go and get it, done. Right? That is a real thing that exists. <laughs> Ten years ago, if I would have told you that was a real thing that existed, that would have been as crazy as the time-traveling monkey concept, right? <laughs> We're living in a world that's moving real fast. You guys are all living in a world where the ideas that you have can be realized real quick. And it's possible that the things that you dream about, the things that you keep inside you might not even exist yet. Maybe in a year, two years, five years, ten years, you can make them real. And you can make them things that change people's lives. But you have to try. So usually I end with a book, kid's book. Kid's book's pretty small. It's a lot of you guys. So maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an uh, imagination reading where I say the book out loud and you guys imagine the pictures in your head. Maybe you go home, some of you look pretty creative. You could draw the pictures out yourself, send them to me. Make my job that much easier. <laughs> This book is called An Awesome Book. Let's put the microphone down for this one. An Awesome Book by me. <laughs> there are places in the world where people do not dream of rocket-powered unicorns and candy cane machines, of magic watermelon boats and musical baboons, or teeny tiny trumpet players training pet raccoons. Yes, there are places in the world where people dream of dreams so simply unfantastical and practical they seem to lose all possibility of thinking super things, of dancing wild animals with diamond-coated wings. Instead, they dream of furniture, of buying a new hat, of owning matching silverware. Could you imagine that? Instead, they lay awake at night wishing for a car, and not one that runs on jelly beans, but one that's regular. They dream of breakfast sandwiches, they dream of telephones, sometimes they even dream of dreams that aren't even their own. Yes, there are places in the world where dreams are almost dead. So please, my child, do keep in mind before you go to bed, to dream a dream as big as big could ever dream to be. Then dream a dream ten times as big as that one dream you see. Then once you've got that dream in mind, please dream a million more. And not a million quiet dreams, a million dreams that roar. A million dreams so loud they scream, so loud they sing and shout, so super huge they say, hey world, guess what I'm dreaming about? I'm dreaming about everything that no one thought to wonder. Dreams so big that they've got dreams and they've got dreams up under. Please dream for those who've given up. For those who've never tried, please use your dreams to make new dreams for all the dreams that died. Because you're the ones whose dreams can be whatever dreams you want. Whose dreams can change the way things are and the way that things are not. And if they say that all your dreams seem too big to come true, you tell them that I told you? That's what dreams are meant to do. They're meant to make you seem as if you don't know up from down. Because dreams are dreams. And that's why dreams are worth having around. So if you think your dreaming's done, just remember what I said. Close your eyes, my child, and dream that perfect dream inside your head. The end. Thank you guys so much. You guys were awesome. Thank you for putting this on. Thank you guys for supplying the beer. Thank you guys for putting the money together for the space. It was really great. You guys are amazing. Thanks so much. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me get some water and then you guys can ask me questions. <laughs> I'm going to pretend like that just didn't happen for a second. Hold on. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah. I know. I'm just going to I'm not going to Do it. 
Do it. I'm super good at making girls cry. <laughs> so great. It's cool. All right, so we're going to do a Q&A with Dallas right now. If you guys right. have any questions. Feel free. If you don't have questions, it's cool. If you do, it's cool. Whatever. Yeah. What do you dream about? Man, it's crazy because I get that question a lot. That's probably one of the top questions that I get when I have to do interviews with people. And the real answer is I'm fully in my dream right now. Like I'm, every day is kind of more of the same. Like today I woke up. No. Today I didn't go to sleep. <laughs> I'm on tour. I was in Portland yesterday. I was trying to leave Portland, but there, was no, there were no flights leaving after my last reading, so I had to leave at midnight. I got to Chicago at 5 in the morning. My first reading was at 8 in the morning, so I was like, there's no reason to sleep. <laughs> so then I went and lived my dream a little bit. I went and read to maybe 2,000 elementary school kids, two different schools this morning. Then I went to an ad agency and read to a bunch of adults that <laughs> sell you guys tires and things. I don't know what they do. <laughs> and I came and talked to you guys. I think it's important... Maybe if you have a dream, a really specific dream, right? Like you say, uh, I want to be a writer. That you peel that back a little bit and you start thinking about the elements that make up that dream, right? Like what is it about being a writer that you like? Is it that you want to be famous? Is that you want to emulate writers that you grew up reading? Because chances are the writers you grew up reading didn't grow up reading themselves, right? They grew up on other people. So for me, the parts of, of my dream have to do with really broad ideas which are like meeting people, sharing concepts, traveling, not necessarily having to have a clock, right? So I get to live those parts of my dream and it just so happens that they fit into the framework of kids books which is again this is totally made up, right? This isn't like this isn't a thing. I'm reading at a kids book at a beer sponsored this is probably illegal. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> this isn't a thing that happens. It's just you just go do it and figure it out. I grew up in a world of like uh, you do it yourself, right? Like, you know, what he wants to do it, you do it. And you get in the van and you go around and you make it real. And then, if you like doing it, it doesn't matter. It'll just happen and you're doing the thing that you love. So that's it, I'm in it. I'm in my dream, more of the same. Good question. Yeah, my buddy. Do you have uh, any advice for someone trying to self-publish a book? Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, you know, you gotta love what you're doing, right? Like, I think, it's kind of like what I just said, right? Like, I live in LA and a lot of people there, the type, when you say you're a writer in LA, it usually means you're a screenwriter, right? And to write a screenplay, unless you have a bunch of money to fund that screenplay, or you've already written really successful screenplays, chances are you have a box full of ideas, some of which have been made and some of which haven't, right? And for me, that's kind of hard to justify because the ideas that I have that I want to spend time with are ideas that I want to make and share with people. So, if I have to go down to Kinko's and staple them together and put them out and sell them to people on the street, I'll do it because I believe in it, right? And you see people that are super religious, right? Like dudes on the street handing out pamphlets seem like crazy. Those people are emphatic because they seriously believe what they have to say is going to help you, right? They seriously believe that they have the answer. And I feel like that's how you should feel about the things that you make, right? So if you're going to self-publish, I think you got to feel that way because otherwise, you're just using it as a gate to get to another step, right? You're using it to become J.K. Rowling or whatever, you, whatever, whoever, Stephen King, right? But if you really believe in what you're doing, I think it's a great idea. It's what I did, not by choice. I tried to get my books published and publishers were like, whoa. And I was like, all right, I'll see how this is. This seems, people make books, that seems easy enough. Super hard. <laughs> but I put it out and it works for me. But I think it only worked because I believed in what I was doing. I think if I, was, if I had made a book about like a, a monkey that chases a duck or something, just like, oh, I know kids' books are popular. I'll make a kids' book. It'll sell a bunch of copies and they'll, they'll pay me and I'll live in a mansion. I don't think it would work that way. Maybe it would. Maybe somebody's got better luck than I do. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think you have to believe in it. Yes. Like a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I had a kid super young. At the time, I you know, doing what people do when they're super young, just fucking off, right? And uh, I had a kid and I was like, oh, this is a real human. This human is more important than I am. And now I want to make things for this human. I want to create knowing that this human exists and that the world that I live in 
is affected not only by me, but by him. The types of things that I make are going to help inspire him and he's going to help change things, right? So, it's really cool because I didn't, I didn't write Awesome Book till he was about five. So, it's not like he came into the world and I was a really successful author. It's he came into the world and I, you know, I was like, he got to see the whole process from drawing to, you know, uh, putting books together myself to shipping things out of my house to getting distributors to getting publishing deals to going on tours, the whole thing. And so I think that's really important because you, you know, when you're a kid, like I said, I don't know where this thing was made, right? Like I, a book comes from a store, right? How do they get made? How, who makes them? Are there pe people can make them? Oh, I can make them? That's important, right? The sooner you learn that, the sooner you get to a place where there's not a distance between you and the guy on stage. Right, like when I go and do readings and they're like, there's a stage and a microphone and it's like real absurd and I'm up here and you're down here, it makes me feel like a cop, right? Like, like I grew up in a world of like, let's be in a living room and communicate with each other because we're all humans. I'm not better than you and you're not better than me. That's what I enjoy. That's just a personal taste. But I think that's an important step to learning how to make things, especially for kids. Super important. Yes? Yeah. Favorite part of the process of making books? Yeah. Um, problem solving, I think. Or just like writing. I, d I didn't draw before I wrote an awesome book, really. Like, I, you know, I, everybody draws, but I didn't really draw anything of substance before that. And drawing for me was real, like, it's fun, but I, I know so many people that are better than I am at drawing. Like, and I'm not being like, humble. I just like, I know people that are fucking super good at drawing. <laughs> and uh, so when I first put out the book, I was like, Who's going to draw the book? And then my friends were like, hey, it's for kids. They won't know if you're not good. <laughs> so then I learned to draw. And it, the books that I've written are all kind of in continuity, so they get better. By the end of the book, is better. The illustrations are better than the beginning. So that part's like not the most fun. I would say like just having an idea and being able to share it. Also, it, creative advice. I think it's really important to divide your projects into long-term and short-term. Right? Like, I, like a book, if I want to draw a book, even if I took all day to draw it, it's still going to take me like a couple months. So I know I can't finish it today. So I kind of have to have projects that I can finish today at the same time. I think that's one of the cool things about the internet. A little bit of a double-edged sword. You have this immediate tool, right? You have this thing where you can be like, I got a funny sentence. And then you can send it to people, right? But you can't let that be your entire creative process. You have to be like, I'm writing a novel, but in addition, I have a funny sentence to tell people. Or like, I'm making this movie, but in addition, here's a cool five-minute vine, or five-second vine, right? Like, I think you, you have to divide those categories. That's like really important for me because right, uh, publishing world is the slowest. They're like dinosaurs, right? Like, if I finished a book tomorrow and brought it to my publisher, it would come out in like 2016, right? <laughs> like, on a good day. And... That's insane to everyone in this room, right? But to them, it's like, this is how it's done. So I just like to be like, look, I'm, I, I put out a book a day. Like, I, I put out enough stuff on Instagram that there's probably three books on my Instagram right now that I'm just like, oh, eventually I'm going to sell these to you guys, just so you know, <laughs> publishers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I answered that question. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And you have this cool dream job which involves a lot of travel. Sure. So what enables you to like live that dream and juggle all of those things? Uh, ah, well I was born a king. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to mention that part. I, well, okay, I wasn't born a king. My dad, w well, okay, so there was a Nigerian guy <laughs> who told my dad that he had inherited a huge sum of money. Sent him an email. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what do you know? It was real. God, that would be so rad if that was like just one dude that had happened to and it was real. <laughs> just to perpetuate it. Um, do you remember the first time that happened to you and you were like, wait, because you hadn't heard about it yet and you were like, this is real. Uh, no. Uh, how do I uh, juggle that? I, I mean, I sell a lot of books. I, like, I go out and I hang out with people and I talk to them and I make things and I share things and I live in LA, so... You know, when you make a book, 
it's like, hey, let's make this book into a cartoon. Let's make this book into a movie. Hey, how many ways can we slice this thing? I'm kind of lucky because the first books that I put out, they're not really like uh, Hollywood friendly, so to speak. They don't have a central character. They're not like, oh, it's about SpongeBob. Uh, this book that I just put out, Lily the Unicorn, is like my first character driven book. So I kind of made a lot of friends in, a, in high places just sort of in a Trojan horse way because I made these products that they couldn't buy, you know, like they couldn't option an awesome book, but they really liked it and you could tell that they wanted to. So I'm kind of lucky because I've been able to uh, use, those, use those to my advantage and turn things into other things. And then the other answer is that when I first self-published, that was like a huge step up too because if you wrote a book right now, and let's say that none of you guys have a successful track record as publishers or as uh, authors, right? If you wrote a book right now and went to a publisher, chances are they're not going to give you anything, you know? Maybe they'll give you, what, 10 grand, 20 grand or something up front, and then they'll give you 9% of sales of your book, and basically you'll get nothing, which is, it's awesome. I mean, maybe you're living in a place where that's like a lot, right? When I first wrote an awesome book, that was like, it might as well have been a million dollars. I would have gladly taken that. And then I put the book, nobody gave that to me, so I put the book out myself and then it became like a leverage thing, right? Like if you're in the band, you get on tour and you go tour around in the van for five years and you make all your own fans, you're in a different position than, than you are if you haven't done that. You know how hard it is, right? Like I, I got to know how publishing worked from the back end, so then when the publishers all came back to me that it turned me down, it was a whole different story. And they would be like, hey man, we want to give you this deal. And I'd be like, okay, what's the deal? And they'd be like, all right, we're going to give you 10%. And I'd be like, well, I'm making 100% right now. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, no, no, but you don't understand. We're going to do an initial print run of 50,000 books. And I'd be like, I already sold 50,000 books on my own. And they'd be like, oh. And I'd be like, I really want to work with you guys. I'm not trying to be a dick, but like my dad wouldn't let me take that offer. <laughs> So it put me in a good place, leverage, you know? I was able to make deals with a bunch of different publishers, uh, which I don't think you're supposed to do. I know my management certainly didn't think that it was something that could happen, and, but I, I, I kind of made my own path. I mean, you know, it's internet story at this point, right? Like, I, it, across any medium, if you're the person that's like, I have this many whatever followers or likes or fans or people that buy stuff or people that know that I exist, it just puts you in a good position. Again, I don't know if I answered that question. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite book? My favorite book. That's a big question. My favorite kid's book. Um, my favorite kid's book, I think, is The Missing Piece, I think. You know? Like, it, like I want to say that The Grinch is, is probably my favorite kid's book, but I think The Missing Piece is like, like, I think if The Grinch is like The Beatles, right? And then The Missing Piece is maybe... I don't know, like Pink Floyd or like just something that's like still super rad, but just a little different. Uh, yeah, the missing piece. That that that. I mean, I, I assume you guys. It's a Shel Silverstein book. It's like, fucking. It's a. It's like a a pen line, right? Like the book looks like it took a minute to write the whole book. It makes me so mad. <laughs> Like I look at, it, like he's, it's about a circle, and on some of the pages he hasn't even completed the circle. Like he's drawn it like you would draw the letter O, like ah. And you're like, oh, dude, and then you read it and you're like, oh, <laughs> you, so good, so good. But then, you know, adult books, like I, I had a really big, a really big Steinbeck phase for a really long time. That dude's devastating, so good. Uh, I don't know, it just changes, man. I was at the airport yesterday with a bunch of airport books. <laughs> I could read an airport book for sure. Uh, any other questions? In the back, yeah. No, that's you. It's about a unicorn. It's right there in the title, man. <laughs> uh, no, it's about a unicorn and a penguin. The penguin's name is Roger. Roger's kind of a curmudgeonly penguin and Lily's sort of an exuberant unicorn who's trying to get him to go on adventures and he doesn't want to go on any of them. And so ultimately, I guess thematically, it's about, maybe it's about empathy, right? It's about like understanding that even though you want to do something that's really rad and the other person doesn't, that that you have to recognize that they're important, they have to recognize you're important, and, and also that like, <clears throat> you shouldn't not do things out of fear, maybe. You should try things and then decide whether or not 
they work for you. I guess that's what it's about. We have time for one more. Oh yeah, one last question. Yeah, this is you, it's all on you. No pressure. Um, when you go to write a book, uh, I mean, what comes first? Do you think it's a lesson that you really want to try to teach, or is, do you just, is, it, is it just a cool story that turns Super into good it? question. Super, that's probably the best. I mean, not that your other questions weren't good. <laughs> <laughs> I messed it up. <laughs> no, that's a really good question. I was actually thinking that while I was answering that question. It's, it's all theme. I don't know if this is true. This is a formula that I use take it or leave it. I feel like kids books are a really interesting place, right? Because I don't think any other work of art is, is as simple and has like as few ingredients as kids book and is designed to hit such a, a broad target, right? And if you look at the best kids books, like The Missing Piece or The Grinch, for example, right? What they do is they, they speak to the child and the adult equally right 50 50 split and i think again my theory here i think that all the best works of art do that they split 50 50 down the middle right to to the part of you that wants to think and to the visceral part of you that just wants to feel and i feel like you know there's plenty of examples of art that splits maybe 80 10 toward adult or to kid right like like transformers the movie is probably like 99 percent kid and one percent adult right and maybe some Godot film is like 99% adult and 1% kid. But I think the best work of art, regardless of whether it's film or photo or book or any of these things, is 50-50 is down the middle. And it starts with a theme. And it might only happen one time in someone's career, right? Like you look at their whole body of work and you're like, that was the one, that was the one album, that was the one movie where they just nailed it. And those are the ones that I think are universal. And each one of those, when you get to the core, there's a theme and that theme is probably really big like super big, like love, you know? Like just, why not, right? Something that everyone can relate to and then you peel it back from there. That's where I start. I just try to reach as many people as possible. Just swing for the fences. Cause like, I wanna meet everyone in the world, right? And I know it's not gonna happen, so I might as well make a thing that affords me the luxury to meet them in some way. Meet their kids, meet their people. I did a reading in Portland yesterday and I was at this school and the principal came back and she said, hey, we have an art teacher here who used to teach at this other school in Portland that you read at like on one of your first tours like five years ago. And the teacher was like, yeah, those kids are in high school now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like you make these things, like I said, you make these songs and you think like, I just made this thing. And then someone is like, Hey, I, I, so I read this thing every day to this person that I care about most in the entire world, right? Or like, hey, I read this a book at my wedding. Or like, hey, this thing that you did is super important to me. And I think if you're going to do that, you got to start with a really strong theme. That's it. Wait, he has a question. This is, she's got one question. I don't want to be... Yeah. So, I mean... This is really the last question. <laughs> Um, what are you still like kind of scared of? I mean, as you tour and you <laughs> it in some ways, like what things, things, you know, you shake it or whatever. I don't know, man. I don't know that I live that way. I mean, I, there's no way to answer this. It doesn't sound kind of pretentious, I guess, but like I haven't had a really terrible life, right? Like I, I have a lot of friends. I, I'm kind of outgoing and I haven't had a lot of tragedy in my life. I know a lot of people have even in a western way like i'm not even talking like i grew up in a diamond mind right like i'm talking like i know plenty of people that have had really horrible childhoods and have had really tra traumatic experiences and i feel like when you're a kid when you're a teenager you start to make art and usually the art that you gravitate toward is art of of, of angst of aggression of counter counter art right and that art usually comes from a place of like sadness and I don't have that in me at all. And so for me to try to do that, to try to live in a world of fear or sadness or like uh, sorrow is, is false. Like it's as ridiculous as me being like, oh, I got a gold Bentley or whatever. It's absurd. And so, but I do have a gold Bentley. Um, <laughs> but it's ridiculous. And so I feel like rather than pretending, what I try to do is the opposite, which is like, look, 
I'm, things are good for me right now. They might not always be good, but right now they're good for me. So I want to put out as much magic as possible. If you have sadness in your life, throw it on my shoulders. I'll help you. We'll try to cross the finish line together. Because otherwise, like, you know, why are we doing any of this, right? So I, I, I wish I had like a, I'm afraid of spiders, but I don't really have that right now. I'm, again, I might eventually. You know, it's weird that we're like we're all slowly dying right now or whatever, but. It's, it's, I don't think I don't think about it in a way to where I'm like, oh, rats, you know. Let's just get up and make things. What else? So, that's it. That's all I got for you guys. Thanks. Thank you guys.